What's going on, guys? We are here for the next episode of Around the Hearth with the Inn of Planar Crossroads. Today we're joined by, once again, living proof that maybe, oh, just maybe, gingers might have souls. Adam Spain, the Inn of Planar Crossroads, the link to his channel is in the description. Go check it out, because we're running through every blog that Paizo's putting out for Pathfinder 2nd Edition, in addition to a lot of other stuff. Uh, there was there was a lot of talk about encounters in first edition for a long time <laughs> in this series. And we'll probably get back to something like that again. Yeah. Also, we've got Queblin's player from Hail the Gorilla King, Levi's with us, and Donald, as always. Right hand of the channel, basically, at this point, hanging out. Today we're talking about the Bard class preview and the rarity blog. So one thing, I'll, I guess I'll kick it off here. One thing I noticed about the Rarity blog in, uh, in my comments was it's not necessarily about, like, the availability of magic items and things like that so much as, like, whether or not knowledge checks will get you things. I had somebody comment along the lines of, like, if something is rare, it doesn't matter. If the wizard has rolled like a 65 on their knowledge, whatever, they don't know about it because that's how rare it is. And I guess I kind of like glossed over the fact that the rarity blog, in addition to like it can define what magic items and mundane items are available in your setting and how to make like low magic in Pathfinder or like even like firearms and steampunk and airships, oh my, in Pathfinder as well. It also is really good at setting up like basic world building and I can really vibe with that. But anyway, what do you guys think about it? I like yeah. it. Uh, having uh, having a having a general item uh, rarity is uh, is a uh, is a uh, is a nice thing, especially from a GM point of view. So you know what is rare and what is not, and especially if you're doing one shots. It, when it comes to item shopping, just having the list of what's common and what's not, such as how 5D uh, one shots are, are are posted at times, that's that's a good GM tool right there. Indeed, I I like it because you have a a kind of standard that you can look at and say, what do I want to? How common, uncommon, rare, or unique do i want to make these items in my in my game and depending on that will depend upon will edit the flavor of your game and it'll make it a lot easier i know that in 5e one of the complaints was that item crafting and and doing stuff with items and custom items and things along those lines was just really really cumbersome i guess was a lack, lack of a better word they didn't have a lot of variety until the like the third or fourth 5e book come out but i may be misunderstanding that because i didn't play a lot of 5e uh, I, but i think I, that I this will allow it not uh, to be that way in uh, i 2e. what one issue that 5e had when first came out was the item making rules were not as uh, well defined as pathfinder magic item rules so so a lot of it was in the GM hands, how that was actually ruled. And, and even now, the rules are not as uh, flushed out, so it's not as good to make uh, magic items after a certain point because it's not worth the enchantment and time cost to make it. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think on like, oh sorry. I think level twenty, you are you just meet the requirement to actually make level t plus two weapons and armor, or even plus three, and that's it. So by that point, it's not really worth the time. What were you gonna say, Levi? I was gonna say that I think one of the most important things is the fact that there are degrees of rarity, because a lot of times when people talk about things, it feels very black and white when they talk about what their setting has item and style of magic and whatnot wise so giving nice defined tiers of that seems useful 
Yeah, yeah, that's fair. I definitely like, I've played in low magic settings. Joe likes low magic settings a lot. I've played in high magic settings, like like classic Pathfinder and things of that nature, but I've never played in like a middle low. That's never been a thing. And now you can do that in second edition by just saying like, this, this, this magic item, like the kind of more mundane-ish ones like potions or, well, I guess potions aren't magic anymore, but you get the idea. And uh, like symbol trinkets and tokens and things, those exist, but the bigger, more powerful items do not. It's definitely, there's a lot of stuff to play with here. I think it's also, again, I think it's really useful for the people who are brand new to role-playing games, because that's going to happen. In pad, like, I know there's been a lot of people comment on my videos, like, hey, I've been curious to try this kind of thing, and now I think I will, because I watched this and I like it. Thanks, dude. And so yeah. they're, like, right in there. That's clear-cut and defined for someone who's never picked up, like, a big old fistful of dice and thrown them at their GM's face to display the power of their fireball. Uh, uh, having a item rarity rated from common to not common is a nice way for players to know what they can have. One of my favorite tabletop systems, this go back to uh, go back to the GURP system that Fallout 1 and 2 was, was actually based upon. So one of my favorite weapons in that game was the anti-material rifle, and that was one of the most rarest and powerful items in, in the game, besides the energy weapons of the same tier. Yeah, yeah, that is fair. Well, does anybody else have anything they want to add about well, the rarity system and world building, or should we go to the really exciting part? Well, I, I do want to say that I like that they are including, that they're putting unique in there, because Sandpoint Devil and, and Grendel and stuff like that are unique creatures, technically. Mm -hmm. So it's something that you can do not just for items, but for encounters and creatures and... Uh, things like that you can set it on a rarity as well if you're if you're trying to figure out random encounters and they're like okay how common is this and then how common is that and and so on and so forth uh, yeah and it can help you in that sense yeah so I agree. it's it's whatever you want to set it for and uh i like I, I just like it because it's a simpler way and it does not include things like a level limiter in a similar way that Oh, uh, Starfinder did. I didn't like the wording and the terminology in Starfinder with their items and having level uh, leveled items instead of rarity levels instead. Um, so, I don't know. Yeah, uh, no, I, I like this version. It's like, and I'm kind of bummed out that this is essentially the last thing that's going to happen, at least for the foreseeable future in Rune Lords, because over at IOPC, we're getting ready to start our second edition campaign. But we had to fight this thing called Black Maga, and we survived it, but, like, that's well, a unique so, monster. Yeah, you... <laughs> we survived just because we didn't kill the damn thing. Yeah. You, you knew we couldn't kill it. The point is, like, you that that thing, in addition to the Sandpoint Devil, in addition to Karzog at the end of the game, and everywhere in between, that's unique stuff. And maybe, possibly, like... If your wizard was really into the early days of the Thessalonian Empire or the stories of like legendary mythological beasts, maybe they would know what these things are. But the average, like my hunter has no idea whatsoever. The paladin, I don't remember if Gideon did or not. No, Gideon wasn't there. And that's why we had a problem. But the point is it puts like an air of mystique on boss monsters and things like that. And it lets, I guess also it lets the GM keep a little more behind his uh behind his screen as well because as second edition moves forward as players we're gonna learn what the common monsters like what their hit points are what their ac is what this that the third is and with something like rarity you can like pull back on the ranger's ability to knowledge nature into what like a i don't know like an owlbear is if owlbears don't exist anywhere in your setting but literally that one forest which I think is super cool. Mm -hmm. But what's even more cool is we have the Bard now. The Bard is here. The Bard is a full 10th level spellcaster, which is amazing. And I've still, like, I've read through it all the way. I'm caught up. I understand what's going on. I also understand that Lem's art in the blog is, like, that dude looks like he is going to shank you, and I'm kind of scared <laughs> looking at him. And I kind of like that. I kind of <laughs> like that because the dude, like, 
I know a lot of people, I like bards personally. I, I cannot think of a party that's not super happy to have a bard in that party. Even like the people who aren't attacking, the bard can do more than inspire courage. The bard's got the knowledge checks. The bard can fill the skill monkey role with versatile performance. It's got spells that you don't have. Timely inspiration's real good when your wizard fails that fort save. But like, they never shone. They never like, I don't know anyone personally in my life who's just like, I'm gonna play a bard. That's my favorite class. I'm here to do that. Hooray. They kind of like, that's the class that gets kicked around everywhere I go. And now that they're, they have the power of a full caster, I think we're gonna see that change a lot. Uh, bards, uh, yeah. uh, bards, uh, this is uh, one of my favorite classes, especially if you have a party filled, uh, filled, filled with, filled with, filled with bards. How versatile, how versatile they are. And it's too bad class. Kane didn't show up because Kane definitely has five or six bards rolled up <laughs> for a party yeah. of bards. Yeah, bards. Uh, He's my, got a lot my, of stuff. Bards. My my favorite thing about about them, besides the buffs. Sometimes the buffs that they give out can actually make a encounter easy. It would have been yesterday. Uh, we were facing uh, facing a bunch of undead CR CR one half uh, CR one half zombies, and we were continuously missing the uh, the uh, the zombie acing mark. But the bard uh, buff to increase our chance to hit by by plus one. Ensured our success in that fight as we were pretty much rolling a lot of natural ones, twos, and three, and missing the the AC mark entirely. Feels bad, and that's exactly why everybody wants a bard in the party. Just I feel like, at least in first edition and in like 3.5 Dungeons and Dragons and the like, nobody wants to play one because you, you kind of it's for the same reason, in my opinion, that it kind of sucks to be the cleric who is forced into that healer niche. Because, like, without a healer, we're going to die. In in games that don't have resonance, you can handle your own healing. Put that rank in use magic device. Buy the happy stick. You're good. Well, even with resonance, you can just invest in the happy stick. That is, that is also potion, true. Yeah, um, that is a thing. So I really like muses coming, as I'm flipping through this thing. Yeah. Like, that feels... I think it was Adam. Well, yeah, it was totally Adam that said that the bard was going to eat so Oh, my God. Someone's loud. The bard, like, would eat the witch a little bit, and muses feel like uh, witch patrons to me. Well, Which the, I think, is really I think sweet. the muses are going to be, uh, instead of schools like they had in, in 5e, they have muses, and they're a bit, they're probably going to function a bit different, uh, because 5e has more of a traditional, for Dungeons and Dragons anyway. Uh, a traditional set classing where they're basically picking an archetype at third level. That's not happening in second edition. In second edition, you're getting uh, like a, a suite of things to pick from, and your bard will be different than almost anybody else's bard and stuff like that, uh, depending on what you pick and such. So you're not getting a specific archetype. Instead, you're getting a a suite of things to pick and then you can even pick and choose different archetypes and different prestige classes along on top of that and it allows it to have a lot more e even greater flexibility and with that being the case yeah muses are are kind of taking that up there and they do feel more dynamic than just picking a oh just picking a archetype and, or you come from this school or or that school like school of valor or school of lore instead your your muse there's like this this thing that inspires you uh whether it's an actual muse like entity or whether it's just the ideas and concepts of said thing then yeah it is it feels very, very flavorful, so that anybody can be a bard, even if they didn't go to school, quote unquote, to be a bard. They can be a bard. Mm, I like that too. That's why personally, I've always liked the this... flavor of the charisma caster better than the intelligence caster because they just they do it because they're good at it. That's just me though. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, uh, Bard, uh, looking at 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 some of the uh, Bard features that they get as a level up. Uh, I can see them having a having 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 the party slot filled. Uh, even we even we even taking the place of the wizard sorcerer uh, mm. or any other uh, party uh, spontaneous caster that you make them right with the proficiency that you choose for them. Yeah, no, for sure. This is the full occult caster right here this is the one and i still i don't know how i feel about that to be perfectly honest with you because it's like when you say a cult caster i'm thinking like the psychic or the cultist or the mesmerist or just crack open occult adventures i hadn't really put that in my head with the bard but i will say i am really interested to look at their spell list now because like a they're gonna be much better at spell casting b they are the like the masters of that particular school of magic. On the subject of their magic, I really like that the compositions, uh, those are all turned in, like, Inspire Courage is a cantrip now. There's no more rounds to track, you just have it. That's really sweet. Yeah, I think an interesting thing is that both bards and witches probably could have been psychic casters if psychic casters were out by the time they were made, because they are both very much dealing with in your mind and how that interacts more than the more arcane almost like physicist chemists but right that is fair yeah i can see it and i won't say that this is like eating the witch like i had been like i think a lot of like a lot of powers of other classes are going into the core classes to free up the design space for later this like Muses kind of feel like witches, but until I see like misfortune on the bard, and I could see something like misfortune being uh, a composition that a bard gets, and if so, they become even better in a party because they're not just like here's one action and I'm gonna inspire courage and then like shoot twice with my short bow and be done. Or well, I don't even know. To, there is kind of a misfortune slash fortune thing going on when you look at his features. He has counter performance. It's a power one, so he can get this pretty early. Um, and you've got a verbal or a somatic, and you can use it as a reaction. So basically, you use your reaction. Uh, an ally within 60 feet is having to make a saving throw against an auditory or visual effect, like prismatic spray, um, or things like that, Illusions. or some kind of sonic effect, like a banshee scream. Uh, yeah, even visual, it's a visual effect if it's an illusion, so you could technically do illusions. And they get to use your performance check as their role. If it's higher than their, they can choose. If it's, if your performance check is higher than their role, they can use your role. With you, if you do that with your reaction. That's, that's pretty good. That is really good. Your performance yeah. check is going to be pretty high as a, as a bard. So... There you go. But you have to specify. I'm not sure about that one. You, ch It says choose an auditory performance if the trigger is auditory or a visual performance if it is, was visual. Now, I'm not sure if you have to pre-choose that or if you choose to roll. If it's like saying choose to roll an auditory performance for a auditory trigger or or something like that. I'm, I'm not sure about the wording there. Yeah. Um, to me, it kind of sounds like we all just need to be on performance river dance because that is both audio and visual. <laughs> just really be safe. But it's... I guess, I guess what that means is, like, uh, we're going to see the perform skills in combat a lot more. At least, like, I know you had them, and you had things like Countersong in first edition, but you never saw it. The bard... At least the bards I was in parties with is one of two things. It was either you're inspired courage, and you have a short bow, and you're in the back, and we're all really happy you came but you're just kind of there. Or you have the, uh, oh, what is that archetype? The one, well, Joe misses a lot of these. The court bard, the court bard, that's it. The one that uh, the bard of performance debuffs the bad guys. But there's never like a mechanical, this is how I am doing my performance. This is my role to see how, like, how well the devil's going down to Georgia that day. 
on that note if i can get a weaponized violin i am down but like it's i think it's really cool to have that there and not just be like the flavor text that is also like oh, i'm good with wind instruments so i guess i'm also good with diplomacy we it's two well, of my something. two of my uh, two two of the uh, two of my favorite bar types if they are pretty effective in second edition which i hope they do do take in, in inspiration from first edition is the pure uh pure party buff buff bards because they're fantastic and then the uh, you, you 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 seeing most of the classes you 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 treat the uh a uh, caster, caster spells because a bard built for utility purpose quite quite great. Maybe that's going to be a archetype. Mm -hmm. Well, that is the something uh, that I think is, is ahead, pretty powerful and pretty nice. Is that one of the bard feats, Allegro, is talked about here? It and all of their compositions are cantrips, like we said. So you get a cantrip. That basically lets you give somebody within thirty feet haste. Yeah, Allegro is that so good. Allegro cool. was a bard spell in Pathfinder First Edition. I remember it very well because, like, I've been in. I've had three bards that I've been in parties with or GM for over the course of my career. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And Allegro was that was the spell. That was they'd cast Allegro, and while they're performing, we all have haste, which is real great because that the action economy is king in Pathfinder. We all know that one all too well. But now that's a cantrip. Now that means, like, does that mean... I guess it does, doesn't it? I could... At 14th level. At 14th level. But Yeah, that's fair. I'll give you that. But it's still, like, at 14th level, at that milestone, it's not eating the wizard's spell slot anymore. It's, like, Inspire Courage, Allegro, and then whatever. Like, maybe you attack with your bard. Maybe there's another. There probably is. Maybe even if there's, like, a debuff performance, you're just in the middle. Buff, haste, debuff, pass. That's real good it targets yep. one ally this time as opposed to uh as opposed to the whole squad so that's that's a little not as good but you have a uh, like with lingering composition you're making a performance check with the dc equal to the highest level target of your composition which should be real easy to pull off because again you're charisma based and you're gonna sink your proficiencies there so you like allegro then like composition and then allegro and then you just loop that even like before the battle starts if you can and then off to the races you go it does make me uh wonder is is there are you still limited to one composition per round i don't remember reading are you or if you can just cast it, like, if you have three actions, can you just use three verbal, uh, three verbal castings, basically, of Inspire Courage on your allies if you don't have to move? You can just pick three allies and give them a plus one? Is that, so... That looks to be that way, yeah. And that, that with, makes all more the, like... Could give. Good. With the that how... means that you could give someone Allegro three times. I mean, not someone. You three could give three people Allegro three times. Yes, Roll so three good. performance checks and see if they get it for three three rounds or not. Back in the day, when we had small characters in our parties, it's it's rare. Because most of the people I game with seem to be, and myself included, are like allergic to small characters. I'm working on it. I've recently saw a Sphere of Neblin do a lot of work, and so maybe I'm coming around. But... This seems to drive home like the papoose that one would put on like the half giant or the like the orc or whoever that can carry the halfling on his chest so the halfling doesn't have to do a move action and is just like playing his little flute and everybody's coming off better for it. That's so good. My question though would be, can you like Allegro says it targets one ally. In Pathfinder First Edition, you count as your own ally for the purpose of things like that. So can one Allegro themselves? I would assume so. And then use lingering composition on it to make sure you don't have to spend the action for the other. And then your buff, 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 shoot. Or buff, 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 bash them in the side of the head with your adamantine flute, because that sounds fun. I so if want right, a... If they're right near you. Yeah. 
very close. I've I did come to... A, uh, Go ahead, Levi. I've wanted a character with adamantine instruments for a while now, and I was going to play Scald with the War Drums. El Kabong! My, 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 my favorite bard weapon that a GM allowed me to make, I made a, uh, he made the most epic he 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 heavy metal uh, adamantine gu guitar, great axe gu gu guitar for one shot. Yeah, all right, brutal legend. I was gonna, uh, if my orc had died in Rise of the Rune Lords, I was bringing in a Kitsune bard, and I was gonna have uh, a star knife that was like finagled into a tambourine, or I guess rather like a tambourine with like a like a switch I could pull, or like a little like like a, like on a motorcycle to give it gas, like do that motion, and then out come the blades of the star knife, because star knives are nonsensical weapons in the first place. Why not also make it a tambourine? So it's, I guess I, I also like that the. Uh, like, you have to make a performance check to, like, use these buffs, especially with the spell points. Because as much as I'd love it to just be really easy, it keeps it from being just a really, like, I do this, 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 pass. And that's, I guess that's how it, uh, how one balances the bard out and why it would make sense to be able to cast three compositions. Because you have to, like, be actively rolling the dice, there is a chance you will fail. There is a chance you can fail. There's always the one. There's always the one. Oh god, yeah, and then like you break a string on your like violin or something like that and you're screwed. Well, thankfully with lingering composition, there is no chance of critical failure. It is just failure. Yeah. So. Nothing bad happens there. It's just the composition lasts as long as it was gonna last anyway. But again, that seems yep. to be a really easy at least targeting your allies. Uh like that should be a pretty right. easy DC to hit. It depends. I mean, are you going to have to roll a perform? I mean, you'll need to roll a performance check, but the DC seems odd. It says the DC is usually a high difficulty DC of a level equal to the highest level target of your composition, but the GM can assign different DC based on the circumstances. Are they ta talking about the literal level of your opponent? Because that's ludicrously easy. When the dice goes up to 20, and you are level 5, and, uh, well, I don't know when you can get this, uh, like green composition. Power do, 1. Do, 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 do. Yeah, it says power 1. Um, when you, when you get this, and you use lingering composition, say you're at level 5 and you take it, or, you know, you get something. If you're level 5, that means you're only going to be facing level 5 to 8 creatures, right? So you have to roll a 8 or better? And you have proficiency? I mean, I don't know. It just seems like if that if the level is what you have to do, then it's a piece of cake. You yeah. have to literally low, roll way low, like a 1, with mm. your proficiency. If you're, if you're fighting... CR at level five, you're fighting CR. Or keep using CR. You're fighting level four to eight creatures. I mean, if the boss is CR eight, I mean, uh, if the boss is power eight, maybe it'll be harder. But not I mean, that much. I mean, one one like imagines you, said, you got proficiency. One imagines it'll be like ten plus X plus level or something like that. I don't know. It doesn't seem to read that way. At level five, you're gonna have a level. You're gonna have a plus one at least in your performance. So that means you could literally roll half the die. You could roll. Let me see. It's like a forty percent chance you might not make it. Maybe, depending on the CR of the creature or the the level of the creature. Yeah, that's just me. I guess that's also why you have the uh, that little bit that's like the GM can make this higher or lower if they want to, to keep that on the like the logic balance. I guess is the word I'll use. Like it, like if you're fighting like 17 exploding balors at level 20 and you're just well level 20 is you're awesome at level 20. Uh, 17 exploding balors I mean, at level in five. Second edition, you are. <laughs> 
In second edition, you are a demagogue, a demigod at level twenty. So yeah. I'm just so seven. So there. seventeen. Baylor is at level five. We'll say that. And you decide to like jump on the table of the bar. This is a strange encounter that I'm pulling out of my butt right now. But whatever. And like break out your deadly. You unsheath your deadly mandolin. I'm gonna make so many Dexter's Lab references in the bard video. And anyway, and try to like get down and help people. It's very reasonable to adjust that DC. The same is true for like playing music on a crowded battlefield or very wide open area where the sound doesn't carry. It's there's a lot of stuff to play around with there and it's I hope I have a bard. I I was pretty sold on the ranger cuz the ranger is like super hyper playable compared to what we're used to. But like I could see my first second edition character also being a bard. It's uh, I really Well, you better decide since we're uh, we're getting people ready session 0 tomorrow. Session so. 0 tomorrow. I'm like I'm sure on the flavor. I know what I'm playing flavor-wise. It's just a matter of there's a part of me that's like I'm going to play a ranger because that makes a lot of sense for the horse lord. There's a part of me that's like I need to play a fighter. I need way too many weapon proficiencies. And then the third part of me is like throat singing sounds cool. Let's be a bard and be super scary. I think it kind of comes down to like how uh, it comes down to how multi-classing is going to function in Pathfinder 2nd Edition, which we still don't know yet. And if that's important to me. I need to know. And I guess also that's another thing yeah. one can say about rarity is like in Pathfinder 1st Edition, assuming like take the rarity rules, bring them to 1st Edition, multi-classing is the number one way to become way too good at everything. So you just say in a world that paladins are unique or monks are unique or uh, what else is a good dip? Sacred fist war priests, sorcerers with bloodlines that buff your spells. They become unique and now they can't do that. Anyway, that's a that's a random tangent that just came in my head. Well, if you make them unique, that means there's only one. There can be only one. If you make them uncommon, I mean, if you make them rare, rare, then you could go and get trained by them. So. Yeah. I think it'd be sweet to have only one paladin in a given setting because that kind of, right? Only one of any class because that makes that class all the more mystical and magical and and super awesome. Mm. Hey, what else is going well, on with oh, this board here? They get they get tricky. Yeah. Um. There, the lingering composition. We have that. We've got the inspired courage. We talked about that. Uh, yeah, I like the bard feats. The performance will probably. Mm -hmm. I, I like the bard, bard feats that feats, like are, yeah. are adding uh, cantrips from the occult spell list. I see what you were saying before, Levi, about how how the bard kind of feels like Five E's warlock because they're so yeah. cantrip based. Yeah, no, I get it now. I get it for sure. This is Eldritch Blast helps out this time instead of just throwing D10 at the bad guys. And I'm so hoping that a pure like heavy metal singer who destroys people with their voice is viable. It'd be sweet. Well, probably. I want a sonic damage full blast. Having, I am. This, 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 what they went, went, went shot. I played in, which was based upon the game Brutal Legend. I played, played a half orc bard that was combat bard that pretty much used the out of my great axe. That the party pretty much buffed me as a party barbarian, and everyone was a utility or a buff, buff type of bard. And what they went fun. Fun, fun, fun! One shot. When one of the other parts used only sonic damage, so we had pretty much every single roll in a in in NA, uh, NA normal he he heavy 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 metal metal band field. So I was the front frontline guitar guitarist, and one of them was the uh, face of the party using sonic damage. <laughs> Fun, yeah. fun time, fun, fun times. A pure, pure, pure bard party. Yeah, I feel like bards are either like one person will be like, "I'm gonna play a bard." Yeah, I'm helpful. Or it's gonna be a, like a six-man party where everyone is bards and they're gonna ignore the main quest and just work on their musical career. And there's no middle ground. I've never like, yeah, sure, bards are cool. I'm gonna play a bard this time. It's one or it's the absolute other. There's no pure like, no room for anything else. Hey, I mean. Someone could have taken over Tika in the game if they wanted to. That That'd be fun. Them, but anyway. I would have considered anyway, it. Anyway, I. One of the things that I'm thinking might happen 
They're getting rid of the big six, but that means bonuses are going to be all the more important. Does that mean that there's going to be, instead of a required healer, there's going to be a required bard? That's possible. Yeah. Uh, it makes sense. I, I, if I remember correctly, first edition bards, they get access to cure, uh, to the cleric's healing, uh, healing, healing spells. Am I correct? So is the bard going to be the pseudo cleric? I doubt that very much. I, I believe the occult spells will be... Well, there's a cleric. Yeah. I think the, the occult spells, I think what we're going to see are... Man, I don't even... I can't put my finger on it, to tell you the truth. I imagine, like, uh... Oh, what's that spell that Xandu casts all the time? Mind Thrust. I imagine Mind Thrust will exist in some form of, like, sonic damage or, like, the music gets in your head and, and your head blows up. That's sweet. That is so cool. Yeah. Something like that. I, I, I imagine that buffs. Play test, though. We'll see. We'll see. I imagine buffs. I imagine debuffs. I imagine a lot of saver dies at high level. Like, because bards at level twenty in Pathfinder First Edition, like they could literally like you die from enrapturement of their wonderful performance. So I could see that coming down. Possibly. It does. It. Making any class almost mandatory is problematic. I don't think that the bards will necessarily be required. I think it will make the game a lot easier. Uh, because you could do cleric instead, and you have fewer buffing options compared to a bard, but they would still be good. Like, the bard can buff, and it can cast spells at the, in the same round of combat. Uh, a cleric can't do that as easily. Um, there may be a way to get around it and do it, but it would be difficult. We haven't seen anything revealed as yet to make that a possibility. So as far as maximizing your party for a campaign, if you don't have a bard and you're giving yourself, if not, ha having a bard in the party make might make it like easy mode. And then having no bard in the party may, might make it like normal, quote, mode or something like that. And then having no bard and no cleric will make it hard mode. I don't know. That tracks. Uh, yeah. I, <laughs> no, I think I think a part of that is uh, and this is like recent conversations with other game masters that I've had across like real life and the Internet is a lot of that is kind of on the GM. And I'm a little biased because like. 50% of my GMs are competitive Magic the Gathering players, and so, like, those encounters are hard. <laughs> they are very hard. And in a game like that, the bard's real good. You Like, that is, in the tier one, super optimized, going to die if you mess this up kind of thing. Yeah, no, I agree. The bard feels borderlining on essential, especially in a world where the big six is an entirely different, like, format that no longer looks like it did in first edition but like in uh like doomsday doomsday dawn's awkward because there's there's definitely a couple of encounters in doomsday dawn that the devs have talked about like they're supposed to be really hard because they're putting their system through a stress test but like uh -huh. pathfinder second edition ap1 you can probably get away without having that bard but it's also probably real easy with an optimized bard or even two because it seems to me that there's going to be a lot of things the Bard can do based on, like, and especially as time goes on and we get more muses, which I really like that. That yeah. is so cool. Like, a Bard or two would not go wrong for anyone. Yeah, I. Th yeah. from what I'm seeing, a Bard is a perfect fit for any party. Any party can now benefit from a Bard. Any party could benefit from a Bard before. I mean, Bards, as much, like you said, as much hate as they get, they weren't a bad class. They they yeah, were no, a good them. class to do lots of different things. They filled in. That was their job. They they did what they needed to do. They helped out in the different areas. Like if you needed to have some spell casting done, they would pick some of that. They weren't going to be the battlefield controllers, but they were definitely the best. Uh, some of some of the best buffers. Oh man, the they, they could they could be battlefield controllers. There was definitely I don't remember the name of the spell. But it's like while you concentrate, it paralyzes all opponents within like like sixty feet of you as you like you essentially just like hold a note and it paralyzes people. 
oh god, what's the name of that? I don't remember the name of the spell. It's like a level three or four spell, and they had hold person and stuff like that. It's one that they're very controlly. Z Z two DC is high enough. Z True. Z two Z two classes which I like in first edition. How versatile you can make them is the bard and the uh, rogue. Those are the two most versatile classes that you can make them into anything that you need uh, need effectively for what your concept is for them. Yeah, alchemists as well, yeah. which is why like I'm I'm pretty happy. I don't know if I'll play one, at least not right off, because they're they're not like 100% my jam, but an alchemist can do whatever you want an alchemist to do across the board, much like the bard and the rogue. And like, really, that kind of feels like a lot of the classes coming down in second edition. They seem to be like whatever niche you need filled, that class might be able to do it. Yeah. Like we've seen melee sorcerers I right at the gate with uh, uh, I don't remember the name of the spell, but or the spell power with like the ghoul bite that gives you all those hit points back. Bloody Maw. Bloody Maw, yes, that's the yeah. one. That's really, yeah. really good. Yeah, that's a that's definitely one that I mean Pathfinder two PF two E is going to be the one of the most versatile D twenty systems I've seen. Um as far as I'm not because of course there's things like fate and there's things like uh what is it open legend and stuff like that where you can you can make pretty much anything because you make up what's in there but it's refreshing to see a system that makes up what's in there and then you can pick and choose from it like a buffet and start to figure out what you want instead of saying oh like i'm not hating on fifth edition but like fifth edition felt very limited you only had so many options with fifth edition and to be fair, you know, when Pathfinder first came out, it only had so many options. There were a lot more options, but, you know, you only had so many. Uh, you still have a limited number of options within PF2E, but those options are dispersed in such a way that taking them, with archetypes being something that anybody can take, taking them and mixing and matching them means that it's going to be these characters as they grow are going to feel really different from each other uh if you had a bard in pf1e or if you have a bard in fifth edition or if you have a bard in 4e or, or 3.5 or something like that they're going to feel very similar to each other they're going to have a lot of similar things going on and the pathfinder second edition bard is going to be kind of a different animal with the way that the archetypes behave. It's still going to be a bard. It still feels like a bard, but it may not be the type of bard that you're used to seeing because this bard might have pirate archetypes because he didn't need to have another... His campaign didn't call for another bard feat, so he was like, I'm going to dip in an archetype. That's very fair. So. Yeah, I really... And that, like, as you're saying that... It, if pirate is an archetype, I imagine like horse lord probably is too, and that's what I'm going for in the second edition game. So it might be just totally out the window. What I don't even know. I need to get my hands on the books. They're shipped. I got the email. Yeah. I'm stoked. Yeah. But <laughs> oh man, I don't even know. What else can we say about bars? There's there's a lot going on here, but at the same time, there's also like it's pretty cut and dry. Like now they do this, this, this. And they're not like they're not flipping on their heads so much as they're just being brought up in my opinion to be where they should have been and one wonders also if this means we will see the end of the gishes in pathfinder second edition because the bard was a gish back in the day if i understand the term gish the bard was a gish it was two-thirds caster they got up to yeah. six level spells now he's a full caster so a just gish. oh a gish is technically supposed supposed to be a melee fighter that can use magic or a magic individual that can use melee. Fair um, well, that's a bard. A bard could certainly do that. But like, what right. I'm saying is like they're, that they're now they're usually, got usually. Mm -hmm. Usually, it was the magus that was considered a gish or the eldritch knight or, you know, or things Desplater. designed around it. Sure. It had something to do so. with how integrated the two were together, generally to really be considered a gish. Ah, fair enough. Mm -hmm. Okay, I learned something today. But what I'm what I'm driving at is like, the two thirds caster in the bard has become the full caster. Does that mean, 
And I'm assuming it does because the ranger has lost spells, at least for now. The pally has lost spells, at least for now. Like, Pathfinder had a lot of first through sixth casters. That was the alchemist who's also lost spells. I haven't seen a theme here. Hunters, inquisitors, uh, scalds, blood ragers were half casters investigators on and on and on and on you had like all these classes that were they were not as good at babbing not as good at spelling but they could have both spelling makes it sound like they had low no they might have had low intelligence i don't know i don't judge but <laughs> what i'm saying is like i think we're gonna see a lot of guys get full casting potential in pathfinder second edition which is kind of scary because like the caster is the best in pathfinder first edition it's hard to argue that of course, with the four degrees of success, it's different, but also, I guess also it kind of brings back, uh, like, the notion of rocket tag in high-level play. If a lot of the classes that before would max out at a sixth-level spell are maxing out at Wish, that's spooky. That's super spooky. Yeah. Well, with with them getting max-level spells now, I don't even know if we have a caster. I th Do we have a caster in second edition that's a half progression? We do not, not at all. Or something like that? Nope. I didn't uh, think so. So uh, every spell caster gets max level spells. Now they get fewer of them. The wizard always gets the most. But I don't know. There's. I think there's going to be like a sweet spot that you hit where the there's going to be a, a certain amount of spells that usually end up coming up in, in games. And it's either going to be the wizard... It's either going to be the... Um, sorcerer or the bard that's going to fill that magic role at least from what i'm seeing from the from the sense i'm getting i'm not sure that wizards are going to be getting that type of spotlight they used to have maybe for tradition's sake they might but when it comes to party optimization i'm i'm suspecting that bards will begin to outshadow the a lot other of people. option might yeah. be there. I could see it too. Um, yeah, simply really because good. of their their versatility and the way that actions work in second edition. And the fact that you've got, you know, just like with the other classes, you've got ways to customize them. You've got the maestro for the compositions if you want to max those out. You've got the lore muse if you want to do focus on knowledge and occultism if you don't have a bar uh, a sort a rogue in your party. Or you've got the polymath, which can do a jack of all trades type setup, which and has a spell book. Like the polymath will have a spell book to be able to pull a small number of spells from to switch around. That's, I mean, that's pretty good. If you want the spellcaster one, that seems to be the one. Yeah, and my like so, as much as I kind of cringe when someone plays like. Oh, I am death metal on a bard. Yeah. Like when they do that, it kind of like, I kind of throw them the eyebrow a little. My inner progressive guitarist really likes that there's a polymath, like the polyrhythm bard has come upon us. That is so cool. And it gets spells. Kind of a prog snob when I'm not doing Pathfinder stuff. I don't talk about it a whole lot because I'm mostly doing Pathfinder stuff these days. But <laughs> it's there. It's definitely there. So what else is going on? I there's like I feel like we've well, hit think... pretty much everything. Mm -hmm. I... There's the lingering composition. There's the there's the different paths. There's the bard feats. Um, there's the option with cantrip exp expansion at fourth level to get more cantrips if you're looking for that. Like the polymath bard might like that quite a bit. Um, but all that said, I, I'm, I like the bards, you know, like end of thoughts type thing or, or ending thoughts. I like the bard quite a bit. I like that they've got more spell casting now. I'm just concerned as someone who likes wizards, but doesn't get to play them much that wizards might feel I hesitate to use the word, but unnecessary when you have the options of this spont this rather potent spontaneous caster and this rather potent other spontaneous caster that is the sorcerer. Yeah. So. My 
my only issue is how second edition works when it comes to the uh, spontaneous caster. As a person who enjoy playing wizards, part of me see it's more tempting to play a sorcerer or a bard if I get to cast the wizards wizard spell I like more often and not need to play wizards. So it's nice seeing a wizard not need to be in the party all, all the time, but pardon me. Uh, miss uh, miss having that because wizards can do more than the other classes so it's one of those situations by the end of the day if, if the wizard is necessary in a party or not okay so I have, I have to correct myself polymath means a person of a wide ranging knowledge or learning but I'm still seeing polyrhythm I'm still seeing like the jet kids <laughs> unite and we get our 8 strings and we get our d20s and we defeat everyone so that's how I'm going to flavor mine if I play one. That's, you can't stop me. I'm doing that. <laughs> playing playing a all, 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 all bar party is, is one thing that that it, any music lover that, that plays tabletop must do at least once just for the experience to break. Yeah, I played in a all, all bar party once. <laughs> and I think in second edition, that's so much more doable because in first edition, you could do it. Ask Kane, he's got the party, but there's yeah. very specific archetype jumping that one must do to like be able to cover all your bases. And I think there's a scald in there as well. Yeah, yeah, there totally is. But like in second edition, you can do that with five or six vanilla bards because of how like well interacty. Because there I is don't... no such thing as vanilla. Yeah. There's yeah, a, a bunch of pieces in a puzzle moving there's... around and stuff. That's so cool to me. That is something that you're, we're going to end up seeing in Pathfinder 2e. There's no such thing as vanilla anymore. There is, you can, like, the only vanilla that there is, is maybe first level. Because once you start making choices, by the time you're third, fourth level, fifth level, your character is way different than someone else's character if, if they're not you know, specifically trying to build a certain way, your character is going to be very, very different based upon your campaign, based upon the rarity system, based upon what's going on with all the different stuff that's happening. Now, a fifth level character in Pathfinder 1E, you usually know the progress, you knew the progression of the feats that you were going to take and stuff like that, but that's not the case anymore. So, it'll be interesting. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see a system with no vanilla and that's that's especially true because like the feet tax is then like even feet trees are supposed to be going down to like like two or three max th like three i think so it's no longer they're like, like, like feet shrubs now which i'm so okay instead with instead of feet tree because like point blank <laughs> shot feels really bad i i mean it's cool i'll take a plus one to attack and damage but oftentimes i'm not in 30 feet if i'm playing an archer that's not what I'm trying to do, right? I'm trying to be a bajillion feet above you in the air, shooting down. And the, that feet text felt real bad, and now we don't need that. Which is super sweet, for sure. And it opens up more room for, like, if archetypes are feats, and they are, now we can jump around and do just that much more stuff. I like archetypes as feats, on that note, because, like, it lets you respond to your meta really 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 well like and i say i think the bard good the people playing bards will really benefit from having having the system set up the way it is yeah with archetypes behaving that way because like say like say the whole squad gets like kidnapped in shanghai and now you're working on a boat that's pretty bad for a first edition party that has no ranks in swim or six strength or worse six strength and no ranks in swim that's that's how the full casters drown that's that's we all know we've seen it happen yeah ask Emmy. yeah <laughs> in second edition the response to that is next level everyone dips into pirate if they can and they're all suddenly a little better off in the environment in which they've found themselves which is like that's how you because... win rpgs because they adapted. Precisely. So. And that's so cool. <laughs> so an important thing to think about before we strictly say, this is more on the bards and sorcerers taking over the wizard's role, is we don't know mm -hmm. how many spells they're going to know. 
-hmm. And depending on how limiting that is, wizards might have to be there still for the versatility, but I don't know how they're going to balance that point. The power of the spellbook is indeed yeah. real powerful. And I... there's and the polymath gets a spellbook. It so. does, yeah, that's which is true. That is good. that is a very valid. Point. The uh, wizard is always going to be there for their versatility as a uh, as a uh, as a uh, spontaneous caster, unless if you know that you're going to be using a fixed uh, amount of amount of amount of amount of amount of spells for the entire campaign. The wizard is going to be king for how prepared they can be if they know what they're well, going up going up up against compared to a spontaneous caster, unless you can change the spelled out as you go as you go up the level tree or have the downtime to do to have enough time to do so in downtime well i'd be inclined to agree with you except there is a master stat in pathfinder second edition that's emerging and that is charisma because the more charisma you have the more resonance you have and the more magic items you can have which means the more versatility you can have. If those wands cost, like if you get a wand and it costs resonance to sync up with you, that's no big deal. The sorcerer or the wizard, I mean the sorcerer or the bard got, they got charisma to spare. I mean their maximum, their max stat, their 18 is going into being charisma, usually. Yeah, I would say that's be, fair. But yeah. usually. And then their next stat's going to be Dex. They can get their Dex to AC. Mm -hmm. So Dex and Charisma are kind of sharing the top spot as um, ability score necessity. That's in fair. In the hierarchy of ability scores. In and that, that kind of tracks in Pathfinder First Edition too, with like not only with like Paladin dips and things of that nature, but like every race in Pathfinder First Edition almost was plus two Dex, plus two Cha, minus whatever. Also, like on the other side of what Adam's saying, not to like not to contradict him, but to like reinforce that point. Mm -hmm. At least in first edition, the wizard would probably always dump his charisma. Because he doesn't know he's intelligence based and he needs all the spells and he'll have some cons so he doesn't get sniped out and has an okay fort save and like some wisdom, some decks, but his strength and his cha are like they're in the tank. So he could have that twenty right. wisdom at level one. And that's in second edition, that's real bad because like, well, you're not gonna dump in second edition because the roll up is changing. But, like, you're probably, your wizard probably is not going to have more than, like, 10 or 12 charisma, and he'll have that 12 because he realizes to use his wands and his scrolls and things like that, he has to have some resonance. Whereas the bard and the sorcerer, mm -hmm. like Adam's saying, they've got it four days. That's what they do. Yeah. Bard, sorcerer, and paladin will have charisma. Well, the paladin doesn't need it as much as he used to, mm -hmm. but the bard... The bard and uh, sorcerer will be able to make up for their lack of versatility, I would think, by using those magical items that are found. Because, yeah, it's it's your charisma plus your level. But if your charisma is plus five at level one, then it's not. It'll be plus four if you're if you're maxing out. Mm -hmm. uh, but if if it's plus four at level one, that means you have five resonance then at level one. That's a lot compared to the to the barbarian who's going to have like what if he doesn't let's not use the barbarian let's continue to use the wizard the wizard who d who stays at a 10 or even has an 8 Man if he, he had an 8 have, if he had an 8 I, mean, I think there's a problem race. Yeah his race could put him to 8 you're not wrong If like, the race puts him to 8 that means that he's got um one resident resident one real sad versus the five of a bard that's that's substantial and that five is going that that plus four is going to be there that plus four resonance will always be there and it will continue to go up based upon how many ability point investments they invent they put into their uh charisma so say it's a minimum of plus five a plus five that's substantial it is it truly when is you go and look at resonance that means at level five, they're gonna have. Uh, they couldn't do it at level five because I don't think the re the ability score increases work that way. But when they get up to twenty and say they're at level, 
15. That means there's they've got a third more resonance than anybody else that yeah. just has a regular 10. Mm -hmm. And I think that that kind of drives the bard's jack-of-all-trades nature home that much more in Pathfinder 2nd Edition because, like, say you don't have a cleric or you don't have a paladin who's, like, specced in a lay on hands or an alchemist who's got those elixirs of life. No, it's the bard who someone has bought the wand of, like, cure X wounds so you guys can stay alive because it's him using it because it's him that... It's him. What am I, a caveman? It is he that has the resonance to power that wand, which makes the bard... I won't say required, because, like, that, that depends on your GM and the setting and the nature of your campaign, but in, like, tier one super competitive mega optimized parties, you probably want that bard. You probably really do, and 50% of the reason is because he will have resonance for days. The other half of it being just how mm. versatile they are at buffing the whole squad. Yeah, I I think I talked. To, I think I touched on this before when we were talking about resonance. How bards would be the kings of resonance. I'm I'm inclined to believe that bards and sorcerers, and that, and I don't know. That again goes back to the idea of if if the bard can cover all of those different bases, including having a wand of fireball when it's found, because there's usually one in one can in campaign or like like a burning hands or scorching ray or something like that yeah wand of burning hands runs of scorching ray wand of pit wand of uh, hungry pit uh, wand of uh, magic missiles are usually quite common yeah all the ap's have like yeah. here's a wand of whatever and you never use it but now so, why not now you've got the resonance to kill yeah you've got the resonance and you you've got the time i mean Bard, the the saying for bards was uh, jack of all trades, master of. That's kind of the the paraphrased version of that phrase, and it applied to bards. Now it's going to be bards, jack of all trades, master of all. All trades. I mean, could. <laughs> uh, jack of all trades, of master of whatever rogues. you put your proficiency into. That's what we're looking at. Yeah, I think that's more of a rogue. That's more of a rogue thing, you know getting all the proficiencies which yeah. i'm still kind of salty about but yeah yeah I'm so looking forward I, to it, from a personal experience <laughs> as a personal experience playing a rogue that i managed to have almost every single class class skill at a class skill it's quite fun playing a master of 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 the many 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 talents type of rogue while being an expert in like five or six uh, major areas of, of the rogue quite yeah. fun build yeah no rogues are sweet but anywho we've hit that hour mark we've done it we made it there so this is where we're gonna call it thank you guys for coming out hanging out thank you levi for showing up hanging out with us donald as always your presence is a treasure and adam runs into planet crossroads mm. they do a bunch of stuff in 24 hours ish I, I don't imagine it'll take the full three hours but we'll be done with our session zero for the broken universe it's gonna be real good it's adam you want to plug that real quick you want to you want to like sell that to all okay. my viewers go for it well the broken universe is going to be the new campaign for second edition that we will be running on the in the planar crossroads you can come over there onto our twitch and it will be streaming it while we play or you can wait and see it edited on youtube uh either way is fine with us but uh, getting it on YouTube usually means better audio quality, so that might be a reason to do that. Very fair. And I'm, I'm understanding it correctly that tomorrow after we do our, like, our half session zero, where uh, like, we all figure out what it is we're even trying to do, there's going to be... Had we talked about doing like one-on-ones over in the Facebook chat with like, between you and members of the party to like, introduce the characters and stuff like that? Is that a thing? Is that happening? Well, we're probably going to do character spotlights, so that way people can get hyped for watching the next episodes. Um, I haven't decided yet if we're going to do that like one-on-one, -on -one, just me and someone else, or if we're going to do character spotlights where we record something about the person or, or what. But there will be character spotlights for each of the players that are going to be there, and we may record those uh, either next week or 
the week after, depending on how all the scheduling goes. But that's that's behind the curtain stuff. So. Hey, that, that's important. People like behind the curtains. But anywho, speaking of behind the curtains, I'm going to let you guys in on a secret. It's 8.11 p.m. I haven't started recording my Bard video, so I got to get out of here. <sighs> Thank you guys for watching, as always. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos. The next episode of Around the Hearth drops over at the end of Plane of Crossroads next week. Say bye, guys. Peace. Bye. Bye.